Yo, so Raz, yep. welcome to London. Thank you, bro. What's it? Was it your well, it's your first 2019 trip? Yeah, my first 2019 trip, man. Maybe in a year, if I come to London, it's about four or five times. Four or five times, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, uh, I think you're due back in the UK in the next couple of weeks, right? No, next week I'm going to Manchester to watch the game. Yeah, United fan. Amazing, of course. Yeah. yeah. Going to Brighton. OGS. <laughs> come on. <laughs> We're gonna kick you out of the FA Cup, by the way. All uh, right. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're you're a, you're a Singapore air steward, a Singapore Airlines. Yeah, yeah. I work for Singapore Airlines. Yeah, but oh, I don't like too much. How's that? How's that going? Yeah, it's okay. I work in the Singapore Airlines for ten years. And you get to know? travel around, like yeah, I get to travel different... around different places in the world. You know, get to see different sites, mm. talk to different people. See different martial arts. Yeah. And um, so, you know, we've, we've brought you on to uh, one of our Silla Fan TV podcasts, mm -hmm. obviously to talk about a lot of your, your experience in Silla, because you've got, um, you know, you have a whole uh, background in training for the Singapore national team. Yeah. Um, well, remind me when your last fight was. My last fight? You're talking about the uh, last ever retirement fight or... I guess you're the last time you've competed for the Singapore national Silat team. That was uh, in 2008, the Asian Beach Games. That was my last participation. So it was the first ever Beach Silat event. It was held in Bali. No, it was very different from the normal World Championships, you know, mm -hmm. because it was on the beach. You have to use different strategies, different tactics. Your conditioning also will be different because on That's sand... That's like you compare you're playing tennis, you know, you're play, playing in a clay court or you're playing in a building in a grass court or an indoor concrete. You no, know, the ball travels faster or slower de depending yeah, on yeah, the yeah. terrain, right? So for the beach, for the Asian beach games, it was it was different. You no, know, we have to wear goggles. Yeah. And the normal silat equipment. That's crazy, but man. With the goggles. So So what did uh, you have to train on the on the beach? Yeah, that, we, yeah. we and in 2008, we went to the Riau Islands, the uh, Bintan Islands. To Training train camp was on the beach. That's yeah, pretty awesome, bro. Yeah, it was awesome. And the resort really sponsored us all. You know, we can go for all the rides and all the stuff. And are those, are, are those beach games still ongoing? Uh, it, I know there's a few... On the national level, yes, in Singapore. Exactly, national level. Yeah, national on the international level, level has, I haven't um, seen that happen. It's only, it's only four years. In Asian beach games is like... They are like Olympics is held every four years, so it depends on the nation hosting the games whether cool. they want to have beach sea like no. Yeah, it depends. So and um, no obviously, you know, you um, you were crowned a world champion in uh, two thousand and seven. Yes, uh, yeah, in uh, Pahang, Pahang, Malaysia. Pahang, Malaysia. And we've just. We've just had the uh, 2018 World Championships in Singapore, yeah, which you, Singapore, you know, it's my home country. Yes, yeah. yeah, your home country, man, and which you attended and spectate. You know, you were you came as a spectator. Yeah, for all the four days I was there, just soaking in, <laughs> you know, reminiscing about how Silla competition is like. You know, it's like going down memory lane, seeing old faces, you know, seeing friends from other Silla nations, talking to them. You know, talking about our Past, you know, on how they are, you know, how people have grown. And now we see all the juniors from Come all on. the other nations. You know, they are now adults, like full grown athletes. You know, it's like saying, "Wow, that's the progression." You know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the game has evolved a little bit because of yeah. certain rule changes. You know, yeah, it's but more competitive. Before you know? before we get onto that, uh, t tell us about you know, I mean, b getting a world champion status is is no easy thing. Right and uh, you know you managed to do it in in two thousand and uh, seven. Seven, yeah. Uh, I think it's uh, you, I think that you beat Vietnam in the finals. Yeah, I, I beat Vietnam. I, tell us about that experience, the training camp um, that led up towards that championship. Um, you know how intense was the, the training? How often were you training? Um, give us an insight into the, the Singapore national camp. Well, the Singapore national team when I was a national athlete for the uh, Singapore, I was also doing national service. So it was yeah, like right. a con conscription for Singaporean males from 18 to 20. 
you either go to the police, to the armed forces, or to civil defense. So I was I was a policeman for two years. Yeah, right. I was a copper. <laughs> <laughs> You're a fed mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I work office hours from eight to five. After that, straight away, I go to the National Training Center in Bedo to train like for like five days a week. Sometimes it might be six days a week, depending on... Uh, if Mornings, afternoons? No, uh, usually in the evenings. Okay, yeah. So we train for about two hours. And sometimes also on, on not days, we have like gym sessions, you know. Okay, yeah. To do our power cleans, to do our squats yeah. and to do... So I guess you were training... Is, is, is that considered... That, I guess that wouldn't be considered a full-time schedule if you're just training in the evenings, right? That's no, not... there's also the full-time uh, athlete who can apply to be a full-time athlete, no? Yeah. Uh, supported by the sports council yeah. and the sports council will give you a salary. You know? Just because I'm in national service, you, you're not allowed to do that. Right. Yeah, cool. So I was juggling in between you know, being a policeman by day and being an athlete by night, no? Yeah. So it was Which is an experience that many European uh, athletes can um, empathize with because, as you know, European athletes have day jobs yeah, 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 yeah. Or, st- or are studying. Because there's no, there's no like big, exactly. big uh, environment for this for the Euro- European and SILA athletes. You, know? you yeah. guys have to pay for your tickets to go to the championship. There's like the national body is not that formed like how football, soccer is. Yeah, yeah. It's big, you know, yeah, like yeah. the FA and the FIFA, like, you know, Silla is still growing, you know. It, it still has a lot of potential for it, you know. Yeah. Because now, um, Silla has gone up uh, to TV platforms, you know, there's... Obviously, with the onset of technology now, people have been able to... Yeah, YouTube, like, yeah, uh, Silla Fan TV yeah. has, you know, been uh, ex- help expose Silla on a global YouTube level you know, for... S- social media platform from Instagram, you know, like now budding Silla athletes who wants to fight, they can uh, watch the videos and learn certain techniques, you know, your yeah. breakdowns of the videos, you know, yeah. so they have, they are better equipped, yeah. you know, mentally yeah. better equipped to fight, yeah. to, to compete. So, okay, so you were a part, so you were a policeman whilst you were training uh, for the World Champs. Um, you know, you, you were there in Pahang. Tell us about the experience of a world championship, of a Silat world championship. And I know you've competed in other sports, yeah. and maybe you can uh, give us a comparison of how it feels to com- to compete in a in a Silat world championship uh, in comparison to other sports. Okay, uh, I first my first martial art uh, was uh, Taekwondo. It was a Korean martial art. Yeah. It involves a lot of kicking, a lot of kicking techniques. So I started when I was like five or six years old. I did Taekwondo all the way to the age of 2021 20, when I wow. was second year in uh, Tomasic Polytechnic. So, so, I, so I your compete, foundation is in Taekwondo? Yeah, Taekwondo and yeah. I competed in the varsity level. Which like, is? Which is uh, university competing against right. polytechnics, competing again uh, against uh, Institute Technical, uh, ITE is a technical school. Yeah. You know, so it's all varsity, so we... We comp- I competed that my first competition, so uh, I won that competition. Then the second year, I had friends in the, uh, my Tomasi poly, uh, Polytechnic cohort that's doing Silat. So I was interested there. I was curious. Mm. You know, because Silat... What be- pulled you in? What is it pulled you in? No, because since being a Malay Singaporean, you know, I'm doing a Korean art, but then my other Malay friends were doing Silat. All right. So I always had that curious mind to see. So how's the competition is like? And then, then when I watched the competition, my friends introduced to it. I instantly liked it because I can use, I try to use my Taekwondo skills to translate it into uh, Silla techniques. Right, right. So then in 2000... And is it, is it fair to say that uh, coming from a Taekwondo background, there is a, you, know, you come with a lot of transferable skills because in Silla, as we know, um, maybe seventy to eighty percent of attacks are on majority kicks. Yeah, right. When, <clears throat> when when I switched to Silat, I had to adapt. For example, like takedown techniques. Yeah. You know, scissors technique, the sapuan, which is the sweeps, and when I take one do I can kick freely. But when it comes to Silat, I can't kick freely. If I kick with reckless abandonment, 
my opponent will catch me and you know. Yeah. yeah. That, so I tasted that experience when I entered my first silat competition, which was at the 2006 InterVarsity Silat Championship. That was your first in- silat championship? Yes, that was my... F- eh, no, it was 2005, sorry. Okay, yes. That was my first silat championship, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was t- so 2005. And then two years later, you became a world champion. That's and two years later, I became a world champion. I guess I just did a Leicester City. <laughs> yeah. When Leicester City won the Premier League. I think the, my case is similar to that case, you know, because the championship that I was in uh, in 2007, the world championship, it was a combination of like strategy and luck, which was because of the luck of the draw, you know. Yeah. First competi- uh, and in 2007, the World Championship, Indonesia didn't send the first team. Right. They sent the first team to the SEA Games, which was um, one month or two months after the right. World Championship. Right, okay. You know? okay yeah. So I was lucky I was fighting the second choice Indonesian guy. Yeah. My first round. Right. Then uh, throughout that journey in the World Championships, uh, it was a surreal experience. I don't know how this to describe the experiences like I was the dark horse I wasn't looked upon as the favourites to win that category you know right uh, I was like you were the underdog I was the underdog and I was new to the national team yeah, yeah. I was considered a rookie you know I didn't still didn't grow up that I didn't have that many yeah. techniques yeah but what I had was like one or two techniques that I lock it down and I approach the Silat game with a tactician mind rather than a fighter, so not fight right. on instinct. Okay, yeah. So you applied sort of strategy. Like um, how I watch Vietnam yeah. when they are fighting, you know? Yeah. It's similar to how a Taekwondo fighters fight. Yeah, very much so. You know, yeah, the, yeah. the, the, the Sabit, the Libas, or the turning kick. Very you know, uh, they, counter-attacking style, Yeah, right? it's very counter-attacking yeah, style. Yeah. You no, know, because I'm not a berserker, you know? I'm a very, very... Tactical is so it's but it has its pros and cons. Yeah, you can't fight tac- tactical every time because you might bring that to a maybe a lesser opponent, then you fight too tactical and you're not seizing the chance to excite the crowd. And you know, so drawing from your experience um, of competing in Silat all those years ago. Um, to what we've recently witnessed um, in Singapore. Uh, I think it was the 18th yeah. uh, World Penchak Silat Championship. Uh, over 40 countries competing. Um, again, I think similar to your experience in 2007, uh, because we just had the Asian Games, um, you know, Indonesia didn't send their B team, uh, but there were still a few other credible, you know, high-performing teams there, Vietnam, Malaysia. Um, what... Well, you know what? What your what your impressions? You know you've been out of the game for for so many years. What have you seen has changed? Or what's oh, it, improved? It has evolved. How you know, how has it evolved? Because uh, the scoring systems now, it's not manual anymore. You know it's computerized with the padding. Yeah. With electronic padding. So it wasn't electronic padding. It's so it's, oh, it's, not it's, it's, it's just, normal pads. It's normal just pads, the switch. But the the scoring system is all wireless. So now. Uh, you nothing, just press nothing, the buttons, nothing is written right? down yeah. exactly. It's all transparent and it's all on the screen. And, and actually, that didn't exist back in your day. Yeah. How do you feel that? What do you feel that's brought to the game? It's brought accuracy. You know, uh, it eliminate, eliminates human error. So it. So now the athletes can look at the board and whether they want to chase the game or whether they want to play defensive. No, and it's. Do you think so? Some might say that that. Because athletes have transparency of the points, yeah. and they, they, you know, you see them looking at um, at the boards. Does it, you know, does does it change the game to negatively? Does you know? Uh, the, the I don't see it as a negative or positive. It's not a negative or positive perspective. It's because they're going to Asian Games and they're going to Olympics, so they have to have that scoring system, you know, to prove to the Olympic Council that. Similar to what Taekwondo yeah, to what, do. to what? Like Taekwondo when uh, they had the Seoul Olympics. Yeah. They progressively they've been doing that, you no, know, to to adhere to like Olympic and Asian Games standards, you know, to yeah. Olympic Council standards. So they have to do that. 
Yeah. And I guess it, it, it provides a lot of transparency to, to how juries are scoring yeah, fights. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if, you know, you automatically you see if a certain jury is not scoring certain points, you know, that it, it's, it's all on the screen, right? So it's, um, um, it's all visible to everyone. And you're right, I guess it does bring an element of, of um, uh, transparency to, you know, to the whole scoring system. Aside from that, um, what do you feel about how the, you know, the, the actual styles of Silla and new techniques that, have, that you've witnessed um, at those championships? For example, I know something that didn't really exist uh, back in your day, but is heavily uh, prominent now. Is the sort of you know the, the reverse scissor? Oh, the reverse yeah. scissor. It's changed. Yeah. It's changed the, the the dynamic of it. What's your thoughts on it? Yeah. And just you know, just to explain to people that might not understand what we're talking about, it's it's the uh, you know we'll probably uh, yeah, play, play it, we'll play a clip of it yeah. now, right? Just to show to show people what you know what we're talking about. Um, but it's it's a it's a reverse scissor uh, and, and an attempt to take down the opponent. Because uh, that rule was in effect because they want to eliminate clamping, clinching, no, clinching yeah. clamping, you know. Yeah. yeah. And that's uh, and when in my time, my uh, fight, fighting era, uh, we can do a lot of uh, sweeps and sub ones. Even if you don't hit the leg, the referee will say stop. Them, yeah, stop, that's right. Pause and repeat. Yes. Yeah, so, but so in order to eliminate it, they say if you don't hit, you get small money. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So. They on their part, they are trying to make the game more exciting, lesser stoppage. So of course, after the effect, uh, the gameplay has changed. You no know, people don't do a lot of cramping. People and they do actually less sweeping. Yeah, do less yeah, sweeping. Yeah. You have to really, really strategize your sweeps in which position you are in the map. Well, with the reverse scissors, uh, it's it's being used. Heavily. Frequently. Yeah, Very yeah. frequently. Yeah. Um, and there's an argument to say that, you know, is it is it making it too stop starty? You know, is it is it um do people would would people would rather see more of a striking sort of silla, you know, where where um it's more of a sort of spectator sport, but does the whole clipping element and it, it, you know, are are people doing it to prevent interactions to happen, for example, if you know if you're if you're uh, on top of points and you go to yeah. you go to defensive mode, you go into defensive mode, and you want to eliminate uh, the possibility of of your opponent getting points back, you start doing scissors or the the reverse. But scissor. that's strategy, isn't it? That's it, yeah. But do do you think it? They should be maybe you know they should put a quota to it because. It it's happen it happens quite a lot of time. Yeah, they, they they can do the same as what they have mm. done to the sweeps. Mm. If not hitting the leg if the referee deems that the protagonist doesn't have the right intention to you know, just to stall time. But it's also it's quite difficult, you no, know, for a referee to make a judgment make a judgment call on that. So but it also depends on You're right. Pasilat and how they come up with the rules for, you know, it's that's yeah. the big boys game. No, yeah. we, it's difficult yeah. for us to. Yeah, no, of course, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, and in terms, you know, in terms of uh, the best fights that you saw out in the in the world championships, have you, is there anything that springs to mind? Anything that that stood out? I think that? I'm so impressed with uh, the class B guy, for, Azim Singapore. Azim, from... oh man, so explosive. I was like. He he was like to me the most impressive. Really, really great uh, physique for a class B. Class B, uh, and I think you're he's 50 only to 18 years well, old. Well, that's my category. Yeah, I think he's 50, 50, uh, 50 to fifty five kg. Uh, yes, if, you, if you're and talking, he was so tall. I think he's probably maybe as tall as you. And if you're talking about like class B, class C, class, this is the average Southeast Asian size that has the most quantity in the yeah. class. You know, so it's like you're comparing Mighty Mouse. UFC, small size, and yeah. he, he can fight like Master Yoda, you know? it's like yeah, yeah, fast yeah, yeah. movements, and yeah. you can see more techniques rather than the heavyweight class where they have like lesser techniques, 
but they have size, you know. Yeah. It's, so it's more it's more power. It's, it's more, more power and it's uh, more power yeah. and placement. But yeah, the lighter classes, which see like it's a Southeast Asian sport, and that's where the quality comes from. The numbers. So for him to win the world championship is not easy. It's impressive, and yeah. for seventeen, eighteen year old, yeah, you know, he can go further impressive. in this sport. Yeah. and for the like for other like my Singapore athletes who won the two thousand eighteen. I'm happy for like Iqbal you know, to win the Tungal. He won the ah, Tungal. Of course, yeah, yeah. You know, he, since young he trained. Yeah. And every yeah, competition and every well. competition he's going for the grind. But yeah. still he didn't get the gold medal for not for him to win the gold medal and like I, Singapore did really well. Singapore yeah, did Singapore really well. Is the first time the overall champs and the setup. Woo. Speak about the setup. Level. Speak it's, about the setup. This, I mean, for the first time, you know, we there was uh, a full broadcast team. Yeah, full broadcast team. The whole stage, world was able to watch it. The lighting system. The video setup. It was in one of the probably the best venues in Singapore. Yeah, it's, it's, OCBC it's like Arena. Proper. Yeah. Singapore OCBC Arena is like big space, audience space, TV. You know, it's like that's what now every country wants to replicate that if they want to do World Championship. You know, it's like Singapore ha- held a high standard, no? For what, other what, what did you think about having three mats? I know they had to do it for logistically three three mats over uh, instead of two mats. I, I mean, in my opinion, it was it was hard to try and focus on certain fights. You know, there were so many fights happening at the same time. Um, were you okay with that? What was your opinion on that? I believe it's just time constraints. Yeah. You know, it's logistical constraints. They have to do that, no? What I think is, I yeah, they have to do that because it's not easy, you know, organizing a big competition like that. And if they want to do three, so they just uh, being efficient. Yeah, yeah. And being efficient. That's yeah. that's to me that that's my take on it. Uh, being efficient. So uh, we heard a lot, uh, sort of, uh, in the world championships that you know, obviously now we've still has been in the Asian games, and that's that's a tick in that box. Um, there, there are many countries sort of, you know, that are being developed and, there's, you know, we saw a lot of new yeah. new countries um, in Singapore uh, competing. Uzbekistan, you know, we, we had a Class D world champion from Uzbekistan. And I can't believe I'm saying this. I watch an American fight, a British guy. <laughs> I see a lot of competitions like, America versus UK. It was like, whoa. It was like, proper, yeah. You know, that's where, where you see, wow. That's okay, true. This is a proper world championship. USA, yeah. but you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Abdul, yeah, Abdul and uh, Abdul, and Pereira, Adam, Abdul, Pereira. Adam Pereira, Adam Pereira, who fought really well and got to yeah. uh, got to the finals. And the first ever final, that. And it's actually, before you Asian, finish that, yeah. exactly, it's not Asian. In a class like a D, Central Asian. Yes, yeah. With an American guy, you know, especially in the class D category, where you expect some like of the, Indonesia the versus best Thailand Vietnam, or Indonesia, Malaysia, or Malaysia, Singapore, Malaysia, exactly, you know? yeah, yeah. So, so we had a non-Asian final. So it shows the progress, you know. It yeah, shows that yeah. if you want to reach an Olympic level, you have to have these kind of countries that suddenly stand up and say, "Yeah, yeah." yeah. So it gives hope, gives opportunities for Silat to be an Olympic sport. I hope. You know, I'm I'm an optimist. You know, I hope one day Silat will be in the Olympics and everybody can enjoy it. It's like exciting sport, you no? Know? Yeah. It's fast twitch movements. You know, it's like counter attacking game. You know. It, See, like it's an exciting game. See, like it's an when it's yeah, sport. when it's when it's executed, you know, by by well trained athletes, you know, that's why we're here, right? That's why we're here promoting sport. It's a, it's an explosive spectator sport. Yeah, it can be improved, of course. It's, it's good now, but it can be improved in other ways, you know, <clears throat> social media presence, and uh, other countries are really now catching up. You know, especially Europe now has. A better circuit than what I used to have. No, Belgium open every year. Every year, really every consistent. Year, one know, of the best tournaments like, in yeah, Europe. One of the yeah. It's planned well. You no, know, they send invites early and they make it proper. And the videos now, still I look forward to every highlights of the you know, Belgium open every year. You know, and I can see you know now how's how's the scene in Europe is yeah. like. So, um, so you stop say that now. Um, yeah, I've retired in 2009 when I won the National Silat Championship. Okay. Uh, g- let me give you a fun fact. Go on. When I win the World Championship, I was never a national champion before. 
Okay. Yeah. So I won the national championship. Oh, so you did it in reverse order? Yeah. Because normally you have to be a national champion before you become a world champion, right? No, because I entered the reserve squad of the national team first. So every championship, there will be a selection. So I entered the selection. Because the selection was given to uh, given opportunity to everybody who who want to stick for the first choice. Right. Yeah, so when I entered the national team in 2006, after two months, there was a selection for the Paris Open, France Open. So when I was fighting for that competition, uh, selection, yeah. I won that selection. Yeah. And that was my first time ever being just in a national team going to Paris. Uh, oh, wow, the France okay. open, no? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it opened my eyes to what, what Europeans do see like that. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. And that's I think that's where we that's where we yeah, met yeah, all those where, years where ago. We met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After yeah. that, the Belgium Open, the UK, Silla open, open, yeah, you know, yeah. fighting a Silla competition in London, yeah, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. And so are you? So yeah, you stopped. You stopped uh, competing in Silla. What What are you training now? Are you Are you still involved in martial arts? I know so you came from Taekwondo. Have you yeah. done any other martial arts? After I retired from Silat, I joined, uh, I started practicing uh, mixed martial arts. But I do practice. Did, like, you, did you find your Silat helped? Your... Of course, of course, of course. Yeah, like, for example, the Jatuhan techniques, the takedown techniques, I transferred it to Olympic wrestling and to judo competitions, to Japanese jiu-jitsu competitions. It oh, helps. Wow. Because the, me- the mechanics, the biomechanics is... The same. It's not the same. It's similar. For yeah. example, in Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, if a person kicks me, suddenly it's just silat takedown modes. Or yeah. for example, when in Judo or in Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, when you fight with a gi and you want to do a certain Judo takedowns. Yeah. For example, like the Uchi Mata, the leg rip is similar yeah. to a silat, okay, but yes. when you rip the legs. Yes, got you. So, yeah, 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 yeah. so that I competed in different martial arts like... Uh, Olympic wrestling, uh, Japanese jiu-jitsu, you know, nogi grappling. So it was, it was a different experience. You know, it was like I like to test myself in different martial arts. What are you so. doing now? No, I'm more. Now you're skateboarding, isn't it? Yeah, I'm now more into guy, skateboarding, this guy's man. A skateboarder. Yeah, <laughs> nah, but I've been skateboarding since I was like 13 years old. Yeah. When I was doing uh, taekwondo, Ko married currently. family now. Yeah, I'm married and family now. I'm just relax, you know. I'm not in that competitive mode. I I consider myself semi retired. Not retired fully semi retired. It's hard, it's hard to I think as whatever sport, whether it's Silla, Taekwondo, it's hard it's you, you find it hard to give up the fighter in you, you know, always wants to or maybe one more competition or maybe one more. Nah. Maybe I still got it. No, you're done. Nah. It's, all, I'm, it's all finished. I'm the I like to be the jack of all trades most of none, you know. I like to sample different Martial arts, competition style, different techniques, different strategy. It's like after you play chess, then you play Command and Conquer. After you play Command and Conquer, you play FIFA. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like you trying to sample different strategies. You know, because I grew up in the 90s era where rap core, metal core, the music industry was like in the hybrid mode, like Linkin Park. You know, mix okay, of hip yes. hip-hop. Yeah. That mixed with rock, rock riffs. Yeah. So I like to sample, you know, it's like a DJ or sampler. You're I like, like to a sample. proper postmodernist. Postmodernist? <laughs> nah. Bit of this, bit of that. Yeah, just a little bit, a little bit of that. Yeah. And, but I was lucky to win the 2007 World Championship. I was really lucky. It was a. I can't describe it because a Persilat who's practiced Silat from when they were very, very young. Would love it more when they win the world championship. You know, when I win the world championship, I was like, it was bittersweet. I was so happy. I won something big, but then again, I was my head was moving. What's next? What's okay? What's, what's next? the next martial art I want yeah. to compete in? You know. So, but I really, I really envy the hard work of my teammates when they really wanted it. You know, in training, they really wanted it. You know, when they cry, you know, but when when I lose a competition. I didn't feel that emotional connection. No? I was still searching. I was still oblivious. Uh, that's, that's, uh, well, that, that could be a, an interesting sort of outtake to have because if maybe if you're not emotionally attached, you can apply yourself 
um, sort of more, uh, you know, w- without being driven by emotion. And you could p- perhaps take a more... Um, cerebral approach. Exactly. Yeah, cerebral yeah. approach. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't put... Um, it was just... It was a learning lesson for me, you know. It grows me as a person, of course, when during my national team days, you know, I wasn't the best of students. You know, I was stubborn, you know. You're young, you're stubborn, you're, you're oblivious to things, you know. But after that experience from retiring for the national team, I start to you know, communicate more, you know, talk to people, you know, be mature about things. Yeah, yeah. Don't be, don't be too affected too much, you know, respect, you know. Cool, man. Yeah, that's what I do. Well, Raz, thanks for uh, coming to our Select Fan TV podcast. It's been a pleasure. As always, you don't need an invite. You're always welcome yeah, here, probably. back in London. Yeah, I hope but we'll do another podcast you, on this, you know. You're feeling hungry because um, I think it's time for a kebab, bro. Yeah, from a kebab. Is it time for Turkish food, man. Let's, get, let's go, yeah. bro. Let's go. All right, cheers, bro. Right. Nice one, bro.